Afternoon. This afternoon, Pastor will be continuing in Philippians 4, the demonstration of gentle joy in our prayer meetings this Wednesday at its regular time. So I'd ask uh, as we begin, uh, we turn in our Bibles for our call to worship in Psalm 2. We're going to read verses 6 to 8. And also ask that we would stand. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 8, the psalmist writes, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Amen. Let's come before the Lord as we open our time in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, What we see here in verse 8 is exactly what has come to pass. The fact that our Lord and Savior, who sits on the throne in glory, has been given all things. He's been given the nations even through the very ends of the earth as his possession. And he rules and reigns in glory and everything is his. Everything has been given to him. He possesses all things and it is he who we come before this afternoon and give homage and give, give glory to his most perfect and excellent name. Mm-hmm. Lord, we know that this was all in your plan and purpose for us. That you would send your son. Thou art my son. And that he has done all things well. And it is his righteousness that we are clothed with. Not a righteousness of our own. But Christ's righteousness. Mm -hmm. That when you look at us, you do not see our sins, but you see us clothed in his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And it is he who, who is ruling and reigning even now. So we pray as we would gather here this afternoon that you would bless our time as we would worship you, as we would give you all praise, honor, and glory. Bless our pastor as he opens up the word here in, from, in Philippians 4. Bless our time around the table of remembrance to again call to mind the great things that Christ has done for us. Knowing that he rules and reigns even now, that all things are his, 
He owns it all. He appoints it all. He rules above it all. And that one day he will return. And we will see him as he is. Until then, Lord, keep us faithful. Help us to put to death our remaining corruption. Help us to to be joyful in our service to him. And to give him all praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for this time, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In our reading of the Old Testament scriptures, we are continuing in Leviticus chapter 25, picking up the reading at verse 23 and reading to verse 34. Last week, in the first 22 verses of chapter 25, we read of the land and estate of the Israelites in Canaan, the occupying and transferring of the land of which they were to be under the divine direction, as well as the management of religious worship. For just as the tabernacle was a holy house, so Canaan was a holy land. And in relation to the peculiar title which God had had to this land, he appointed that every, we looked at, we read, that every seventh year there should be a year of rest from working the land, from occupying the land. It was to be a sabbatical year. In this, God expected from the Israelites faith and obedience, and the Israelites expected that God would provide for all their needs. God also appointed that every 50th year was to be that year of Jubilee. That is, that there would be a year where everything would be reset. There would be a reset. There would be a a release of all debts and mortgages. So, and and as and as I had mentioned, as we know, the the nation of Israel never got to the the year of Jubilee. Picking up now in verse 23. Um, we'll read that the, the we'll continue to read the sale and redemption of of the land, um, and then of um, also of uh, the sale of houses and cities and and, vil- and villages, and with a provision specifically for um, Levite cities. So let's pick up the reading, Leviticus 25 at verse 23 to to verse 34. Verse 23, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Thus, for every piece of your property, you are to provide for the redemption of the land. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Or in, a, in case a man has no kinsman, but so recovers his means as to find sufficient for its redemption, then he shall calculate the years since its sale and refund the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and so, retu- and so return to his property. But if he has not found sufficient means to get it back for himself, then what he has sold shall remain in the hands of its purchaser until the year of Jubilee. But at the Jubilee, it shall revert that he may return to his property. Likewise, if a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city, then his redemption right remains valid until a full year from its sale. His right of redemption lasts a full year. But if it is not brought back for him within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city passes permanently to its purchaser throughout his generations. It does not revert in the Jubilee. The houses of the villages, however, which have no surrounding wall, shall be considered as open fields. 
they have redemption rights and revert in the Jubilee. As for, city, as for cities of the Levites, the Levites have a permanent right of redemption for the houses of the cities which are their possession. What, therefore, belongs to the Levites may be redeemed and a house sale in the city of this possession reverts in the Jubilee. For the houses of, of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the sons of Israel. But pasture fields of their cities shall not be sold, for that is their perpetual possession. May God bless the reading of his word. Our confessional heritage, we're continuing to read through the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 52. And in God's providence, we are concluding the uh, Heidelberg Catechism today, reading questions and answers 128 and 129 as we continue to look at um, the questions relating to the Lord's Prayer. So let's read questions 128 and 129 together. Question 128. What does your conclusion to this prayer mean? Answer 128. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever means we have made all these petitions of you because as our all-powerful king, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good and because your holy name and not we ourselves should receive all praise forever. Question 129. What does that little word amen express? Answer 129. Amen, amen means this shall truly and surely be. It is even more sure that God listens to my prayer than that I really desire what I pray for. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 495, Fill Thou My Life. Let's stand as we sing 495.
let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, you indeed are the light of the world. And in union with you, you have made us to be the salt and light of this world. And the light that we are to shine is not originate in us, but is a reflection of your glory. And we ask that you would enable us by your spirit to do those good works that you have prepared beforehand for us to walk in that may be evidence and obvious to others that we are your children and that our lives would occasion praise to you, our Heavenly Father. Teach us to this end as we open your word to the praise of Christ in whom we plead. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn once again to Philippians chapter 4. In conjunction with our Lord's Supper services, we've been meditating upon the words of the Apostle found in verse 4, and today moving on to verse 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Last week, when we picked up verse 5 and, and saw that we are, we are encouraged to cultivate a disposition of gentle joy, we concluded that study by repenting <coughs> in the recognition that we so often fall short of this disposition, this heart attitude of of gentle joy, of of a forbearing and gracious spirit. And now we pick up the subject of demonstrating this spirit to all men. So rather, rather than waiting to the end of this to repent, I'm going to begin by repenting. And by asking forgiveness and also expressing thankfulness for your forbearance, For I confess I'm not the example that I need to be for you of this kind of spirit that Paul certainly was for the people in Philippi. My emotional equilibrium is often too much dependent upon fluctuating feelings and changing circumstances rather than the consistent faithfulness of my Lord. I often indulge in a complaining spirit And I can be disturbing to others and gruff, caustic, and I need to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, which we'll look at briefly in a moment. I confess there are times where I've come to church in a sour mood, and you can tell it by just looking at me. Not because there's been some personal tragedy or any real cause, for Christian empathy, but just because I'm indulging a selfish, petulant mood like those moody kids Jesus describes in Luke 7 who can't be satisfied when they're playing a flute and you won't dance or they're singing a dirge and you won't moan. Too often, as Paul warns us not to in Philippians 3, looking out for my own personal interest as instead of the interest of others. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the word curmudgeon. That's a word that describes an irritable, negative, complaining old man. Do you know the word that is the companion term for the female counterpart of this? Termagent. A nagging, complaining, quarrelsome woman who often, through nagging, endeavors to get her own way. 
Brethren, we live in a narcissistic world. Mm -hmm. And we're influenced by that self-centered narcissism. Our conversations can be along the lines of, I ask you to listen while I talk about myself, and then I'll ask you if you could please talk about me as well. Mm -hmm. We need to repent for failing to demonstrate this disposition of gentle joy that we studied last time. I want to be a refreshment to you. I want to be a cause of comfort and an occasion of hope, not, not a draining drag on you that weighs you down, depletes you of your joy and your spiritual strength. I, I want to stimulate you to love and to good deeds. We have enough people in our lives who are depleting. I don't want to be another one. So I thank you for your forbearing and ask that, that you with me would repent. The repent of, of excusing ourselves for cultivating a joyless spirit. We're not going to look at the text, but earlier in Philippians chapter 2 and, and verse 14, Paul gives a, a very direct command. And he says, do all things without grumbling. Do we grumble too much? Is the content of our conversation, the content of our conversation, dour, dismal, depressing, depleting, telling others of our troubles and reminding them of our troubles and just being troubling? A Christian ought not to be a long-faced, whining, groomy griper for whom life is just too much to bear. We need to stop grumbling. So much of how we affect one another has to do with our words. The words that we say, and sometimes the words that we don't say when there's an opportunity to say. And sometimes we say too much in a grumbling spirit because of a self-centeredness, and sometimes we don't say what we should say because of the self-centeredness. And Paul is telling us that we are to demonstrate this disposition of kingdom joy and to learn, as we saw last time, this kingdom joy from the king who himself who says, Come unto me, all you are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Learn of me because I am gentle and lowly of heart. And so it is Christ who must teach us these things. And so this afternoon we come having endeavored to consider the cultivation of a disposition of gentle joy to the demonstration of gentle joy. The demand to demonstrate forbearance or the command to demonstrate this gentle joy. You remember that forbearance and gentle joy are synonymous concepts. And we see this in verse 5 of Philippians 4. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. And this is an imperative. This is a command. It's the same as in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. This is not an option for us. This is not something we can take or leave. This is not something that we can excuse ourselves of and say, look, you've got to understand, I'm just, not, I'm just not wired like that. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. If you're born of the Spirit, the Spirit is re rewiring the circuitry of your heart, your personality. This is not an option. Now, in 1 Corinthians 7, the option is either being single or being married. Paul doesn't command one or the other, but he's not doing that here. He's not saying, well, you might like to consider being forbearing and gentle with others, or you can be rude, insensitive, and boorish. It really doesn't matter. He's not saying that at all. He's saying to us, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I would say rejoice and let your gentle spirit be known to all men the Lord is near. What is the command? Let be known. That's the command. Let your gentle spirit that we've cultivated this disposition 
Now, let that be known. This is an interesting verb. We encounter this kind of grammar on several occasions in the Bible. It's a, it's a command, but it is an interesting verb because most commands are in the active voice. In other words, you do this actively. Well, this is a passive imperative. This is a command that says not so much do this as let this be done in and through you. A passive com uh, imperative is often a command that brings to mind the presence and the power and the enabling work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. You see, if you're a Christian, Paul assumes that you are forbearing. He assumes that you do have a gentle, joyful spirit. And upon that assumption, he is saying with this unique command, this passive imperative, now, let that life of the spirit be manifest in and through you. The command is to let the reality of Holy Spirit life be manifest to others. Of course, you are familiar with the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. The evidence of the Spirit has to do with the transformation of our character. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, here it is, gentleness, self-control against such things, there is no law. So we are to demonstrate, being active, the fact that we are being acted upon, that there is a dynamic of life working in and through us that is evident by a transformation of our characters and to some extent that will involve a transformation of our personalities. We're being acted upon in that regard, we're being passive. So that we are to develop the fruit of the spirit diligently as we endeavor to put ourselves at the disposal of the spirit and to be diligent in being passive. To be aggressively passive. You see this, for example, in a, in a text with which I'm sure you're familiar in Romans chapter, chapter 12. You're looking at verse, verse 1 and 2, we, we encounter two passive imperatives this unique verbal form. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. There's your passive, I mean, where there's your active command. Present your bodies. Paul's picking up language that he last used in chapter 6, where he tells us there that in union with Christ in his death and resurrection, we are to present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead in Romans 6.13. Now he picks that up and says, now present yourselves. It's military language. It's what you see when the soldier steps forward and salutes and says, yes, sir, I'll do what you command me to do. Present yourself here, however, is priestly language. Present yourself to be a sacrifice, living and holy, as an expression of your religious devotion, your spiritual worship to God. And what does that involve? Well, verse 2, it involves these two passive imperatives. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you notice the passive imperatives? There are two of them. Do not be acted upon by the world so that the world conforms you into its shape and form. That's the first passive imperative. And the other is do be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here are the two passive imperatives. Do not let yourself be acted upon, be passive in the way in which the world presses upon you, particularly at the point of your thinking, but rather be transformed at the point of your life being acted upon by the impress of the word of God, by the power and life of the spirit, as you submit yourself as a recipient of the truth of the word of God that changes the way you think, that changes the way you speak, that changes the way you relate, that changes how you spend your time and how you experience life in this body that you are presenting to God as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service of worship. So we come back to our text in Philippians chapter four and verse five, and, and we focus here on this passive imperative, which is let be known, let your gentle spirit that you have cultivated, let that be known. Let this spirit wrought life that you are a recipient of, passively receiving, let that now be made evident to others. And in successful communication, there are, there are two components that are necessary. There's the transmitter and there's the receiver. If the receiver doesn't get the message, communication hasn't been successful. If other men don't actually know our gentle joy, then we haven't obeyed this command. The command is, is more than just be patient and kind. The command entails this idea, make sure others know that you are patient and kind. Succeed in getting through to others. And be empowered of the Holy Spirit at the point of your joy in the Lord, in verse four, that others must be aware that here is someone who is communicating, obviously, a gentle kingdom joy in the Lord. And it's not easy in our time and culture because we live in an indulgent, self-absorbed culture. It is very, very hard to get the attention of people whose faces are 85% of their time in their iPhones or in front of their television screens. It's hard to get across gentle joy and kindness towards someone who you're walking past and they won't even connect your eyes with you so that you can at least be courteous and say, hey, how you doing? Good morning. How do we succeed in communicating gentle joy to an impervious, unappreciative generation who in large measure and in certain regions of the country have even lost the basic rudiments of courtesy. And it is a challenge. 
But the command doesn't change. For the command is that we are to make our gentle joy known because this is a gentle joy that, trans that trans uh, transcends our own personal weaknesses and personal inclinations and personal background and transcends our cultural milieu and our geographical location because this is joy in the Lord. Because this is a supernatural phenomenon that no matter how impervious the culture or people are in our lives, we are to continue by the power of the Spirit to do everything we can to make this known. To make it known. Now just as it was in the days of the church in the Philippian and Roman culture, gentle joy would have been considered a weakness. It would not have been something that the culture would congratulate. It would have been considered uh, something that should be it, it certainly ignored, uh, certainly not valued, uh, certainly even mocked and preyed upon and taken advantage of. And we live in a time such as that. But the Lord has told us, even as we began earlier, in Matthew 5 and verse 14 to verse 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or on a lampstand. But it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Paul, by the Spirit, is saying the same thing. Let your good works be seen. Let your gentle joy be known. Get across by your words, by your body language, by your facial expression, by the activity of your hands and the way you invest your time and energies. Get the message across that you are a recipient of this joy that is in the Lord. Let that light shine that they may see your good works. Let this passive receiving of the light shine in such a way that God uses you to impress others with himself so that you might be the occasion in which men will glorify your heavenly Father. Now, to whom are we to be forbearing? To whom are we to show this general joy? Only to those who share our same hope and joy? No, Paul says, and again, it's in our text, to all men. And this is a phrase that Paul uses frequently to identify those who are outside of the church. 2 Corinthians 3, 2. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Romans 12, 17, 18. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 1 Timothy 2, 1. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, thanksgivings be made in behalf of all men, for kings who are in authority in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 4.10, for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Titus 3.2, malign no one, be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Christianity is not to be lived in seclusion, in a cloister, tucked away out of sight. 
medieval monks accomplished a lot of good things in their day. And as I've read about that era of church history and thought about what would it have been like had I lived back then, in all likelihood, I probably would have become a monk. That's where they studied the word of God. But monasticism is an aberration of Christianity. Christianity is to be as a light shining upon all men. <coughs> it is to be a light that emanates out of a transformed heart. It is a light that is to be heard through words of gentleness, kindness, and deeds, and seen. It is to be humanized in the life that is lived in relationships so that our marriages become light, our parenting becomes light, our work ethic becomes light. And we are to, through our lives, let our gentle, forbearing, kind, gracious, generous, self-sacrificial service be known to all men. As you have opportunity, do good to all men, but especially to the household of faith. Men are to look at us and to see something of the life and transforming power of the Spirit that ought to call their attention to our Heavenly Father. So the application is singular. It is this, gently communicate your joy in the Lord to others, to all men, inside and out of the, and outside of the church. We are all communicating creatures. You're communicating to me right now, and I am a receiver taking in what you're transmitting. I'm communicating to you. This is the way we experience human life. When those huge faces peer over the edge of our crib and we're googling and goggling and this face comes right in, we begin to immediately read what's being communicated by the way in which the eyes are formed, by the way in which the expression on the face is formed. I still cannot understand why when men pick up a baby, they suddenly go into falsetto. <laughs> but that's the way it seems to work, isn't it? <coughs> Somehow we think, if we talk like that, the baby is gonna understand what we're saying. <laughs> why? Because we know how to receive human communication because we are communicating beings. Our facial expressions, the intonation of our voice, our body language, all of these things succeed in communicating and are powerful means of communicating that we retain through the course of our lives. And of course, the dominant way in which we communicate our, our concerns are words the vocabulary we use, how we express those words. And Jesus tells us that what comes out of our mouths is a mirror of what resides in the heart. And of course, we could very readily do a topical study from Solomon's Wisdom in Proverbs. We could study James chapter 3 and the whole importance of our speech. So here's your assignment. I'm not going to wager how many of you are going to follow through on this, but here's your assignment. Ask your spouse. Ask your children. Ask your close friends who you trust and who love you. Ask them this question. Am I a depleting influence in your life or am I a refreshing influence in your life? What have I conditioned you to expect when I walk in the room? When you see me walk into the room, do you stiffen up and say, oh, okay, got to get ready. Here comes a blast of negativity. Or when I walk into the room, is there a relaxing reception? Because whew, I'm going to be refreshed. There's going to be some gentle joy blowing my way. What have you taught others to expect from you? Are you willing to ask your spouse that question? Are you willing to ask your children that question?
Do you expect from me to hear complaints, self-focused murmuring, or encouragement, stimulations to love, good deeds, reminders of our common faith and hope and love in Christ? If you ask your close friends and family this question and they respond because you asked and give to you the oil of rebuke, don't let your head refuse it. But thank Christ that you're being loved with gospel love, a love that seeks your sanctification and a love that wants you to expand your spirit wrought fruitfulness and service to Jesus Christ. Isn't it true that more often than not, the Lord uses people in our lives? Ask the people in your life, am I communicating gentle joy? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Amen.